Well, praise the Lord. Welcome to Wednesday Night United, our hour of power, or thereabouts. And uh, God is doing some wonderful things in our midst and in our fellowship and in our churches, and we're so excited about what God is doing. I know I say that a lot, but I just live a life of excitement about what the Lord is doing. And so, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're just consistently excited about what he's doing for us and uh, all that he is uh, uh, bringing to pass in the life of our churches, and we're so glad to be a part of it, so glad that everyone's here tonight, and I uh, believe that you're going to receive from the Lord those things that you need. Uh, let's go over to Galatians 5. We want to continue with this that we've been looking at, led by peace, and uh, you know, there's something that the Lord has been talking to me about, and he uh, he was uh, talking to me about it early this morning, uh, even into the night last night, and uh, it it was simply this. Uh, you know, the other morning I was I was running, and I had been uh, talking with some people about some different things, and this would have been on. Uh, I believe this would have been maybe Saturday morning, maybe Friday morning or Saturday morning of last week. And, um, you know, I had heard some people talk about how uh, there was a feeling of, of like hopelessness uh, in some certain situations in the world. And, um, you know, I, I just went to the Lord with that. And I said, Lord, you know, I know what I believe you've spoken to me. And I said, uh, you know, I, I always want to be right on with what you're doing. I said, you know, what about this? Um, you know, is it hopeless? Because I want to know. And the Lord asked me, he said, what do you sense in your spirit? And I said, hope. And he said, that's right. It's not hopeless. There's hope. There's always hope. And, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, and you can do with it whatever you want to do or take it however far you want to take it. But I'm not one of these people that uh, gets up and starts prophesying about different things going on in a nation. But I will tell you this, and uh, it's just simply this, that uh, there is hope for this nation. And there is hope for uh, these United States. There's always hope. God is the God of all hope. And, and listen, it's, it's, it's when believers start giving up their hope that they, they fail to exercise the power and the authority that they've been given. And, um, you know, I'm telling you that I believe with all of my heart that what the Lord said to me back in the spring of this year is still true that there's going to be a, there's a lightening a lightening that is not only coming but has begun to occur and uh, if we keep our focus on the things of God and we keep our focus on what the Lord said we'll see some changes and I believe that with all of my heart uh led by peace and I've been making this statement that peace in the life and the home of the believer is one of the highest evidences of the presence of God in that life, all right? Peace in the life and in the home of a believer is one of the highest evidences of the presence of God in that life. And, and there's a reason because peace is directly tied to everything that God does, all right? Peace is directly tied to it. What I, what I said this last week, I want to say it again, what I hope that you're getting out of this is that peace is a force, all right? Peace is not a feeling. It's a force. And, and what I mean by that is you can feel like uh, there's a challenge, but in the middle of it, there's peace, all right? Peace is a force. Uh, and we'll talk about this some going forward in this message, but peace comes into the situation and it will uproot whatever is calling causing the unease it'll uproot it move it out and it's replaced with peace 
peace is that force, all right? It's not a feeling. It's not a, uh, it's not something that is, you know, people kind of get the idea of peace as the absence of trouble. But peace is actually the presence of God in manifestation in that trouble. All right? In Galatians 5, through 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So these are the fruit of the reborn human spirit. And uh, they, they operate as we will. The gifts of the Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians, uh, operate as the Spirit wills. It says he gives those gifts severally to each man as he will. Those gifts operate as the Spirit wills. They are the gifts of the Spirit. This is the fruit of the reborn human spirit. These fruit operate as, as I will or as we will. All right, I choose whether I'm going to operate in love or joy or peace or long-suffering or gentleness. I choose that, or I choose not to. All right, so each of these fruit were there at the time of salvation. They were given at the time of salvation, and they are part of the nature and the character of God in the believer. Last Sunday morning in Little Rock, I, I ministered on, on this being led by peace and really got into how it is the nature and the character of God. We'll do more teaching on that. But the point of it is, is this, is these fruit are part of the nature and the character of God and the believer. And each one of these fruit anchor you to a specific character trait of God. All right? When, when you're operating in love, that anchors you to that part of God. When you operate in peace, that anchors you to that part of God. And these fruit begin to grow at salvation, and they were given to us as a part of our redemption. All right, so it is my redemptive right to walk in peace. It is my redemptive right to be long-suffering. All right, they, they were given to me. Remember that these fruit are given to you to operate as you will, and they're given to you to cause your life to resemble the character of God. All right, the more loving I am, the more like God I am. The more joyful I am, the more like God I am. The more peaceful I am, the more like God I am. They are given to me so that my life can resemble the character of God and so that I can walk in the victory that comes from having that character in my life. Hallelujah. Peace is not merely the absence of trouble. All right? Because, because understand that there are people that have no trouble in their life, but they have no peace. I've known people over the years that, that they really didn't have any trouble to speak of, but they had no peace. I, I, I have relatives that they really they had no trouble in their lives, but they had no peace. No, they, they did not have that calm disposition, that unmovableness. All right. You, you know you're at peace when the circumstance can't move you. Hallelujah. A lot of people say, well, you know you're in faith when nothing can move you. Faith receives. All right? Peace is what anchors you. Faith receives. Peace anchors you because, because peace is at the core of faith. If you're not going to be at peace, you can't be in faith. If you're not going to walk in love, you can't be in faith. If you're not going to be joyful, you can't be in faith. If you're not going to be patient, you can't be in faith. If you're not going to be gentle and kind to others, you can't be in faith. Why? Because all of those, all of those encompass 
a particular a a, a particular uh, bent of love. All of those come from love. Love is involved in all of those. And and Galatians chapter five says that faith works by love. All right, everything. I'm patient with people because I love people. I'm joyful in what the Lord wants me to do because I love people. I'm at peace because I have the love of God in my life. Amen. So peace is not just the absence of trouble. Peace is that force that calms and overwhelms trouble. All right? When 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 you're in a a trying situation, when someone with peace comes in the room, it 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 removes the trouble. I'm and what I mean by that is the trouble may still be there, the problem may still be evident, but the effect of it is done away with because peace has come. All right? The first John 4 says that perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. Well, the opposite of peace would be torment. And perfect love cast it out. Why? Because perfect love's at peace. I don't, listen, a lot of times in our circles, we'll talk about not worrying. I wish people would quit lying. I really wish they'd quit lying because they, they emphasize that so much. I, I, I don't worry about nothing. If, if, if you're not worried, that means you're at peace. Amen. And, and if I'm at peace... All right? I'm not worried. Oh, glory to God. See, th those things become things that we just, we pick up. Well, bless the Lord, I'm not going to worry about it. Listen, if I'm not going to worry, it's because I'm at peace. If I'm not going to worry, it's because I have confidence in the love of God for me. Oh, hallelujah. So this peace is a force that calms and overwhelms trouble. In John 16, John chapter 16, and uh, verse 33, there's uh, something that Jesus says here because if, if you read through the entirety of John chapter 16, the bulk of it is concerning the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. And, and uh, uh, three different times in John chapter 16, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, that you would receive. And, and then he said, you would receive it, that your joy may be full. And then in verse 33, he says, these things, everything that I've spoken to you, I've spoken to you these things that in me, you might have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, notice the contrast in me and in the world. In me and in the world. He contrasts being in him and being in the world, all right? Well, here, here's the thing. Obviously, even Jesus said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. So he says, in me, I've said these things to you, that in me, you might have peace. And then he says, in the world, here's the issue, in the world, you'll have tribulation. You'll have trials. The Amplified Bible says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you'll have tribulation, trials, and distress, and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, be certain, be undaunted, for I've overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and conquered it for you. Hallelujah. So in the world, there will be pressure. 
all right, in the world there'll be frustration, both of which come after our peace. The pressure and the frustration, both of those come after our peace. And he said, that was in the world, you're going to face these things. All right. Now, the world has no peace. That, that's why Isaiah 48, 16, Isaiah 57, 21, both of them says there's no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. No peace to the wicked. Well, why? They're in the world, but they're not in Christ. And Jesus said, in me, you will have peace. And he said, yeah, I have deprived it. I have deprived what? I have deprived what? I have deprived the tribulation, the trials, and the distress, and the frustration. I have deprived them of power to harm you. And I've conquered it for you. Oh, hallelujah. So if he has, I have. If he's overcome the world, I have overcome the world. And so in Christ, we have peace. In him, we have peace, which is what? Absence of all confusion, absence of all disorder, absence of conflict. Why? Because he's overcome the world and deprived it of power to harm us. And if he has overcome the world and deprived it of power to harm us, and he's conquered it as well, he's overcome the world and conquered it. See, overcome here is a present tense word in the Greek. And, and, and a present tense verb. And here's what it means. He has gained the victory over the world and he possesses the triumph. So he's gained the victory and he retained the triumph. He possesses the triumph. He is currently the victor. We are currently the victors. All right? Now, what, what does this do? That brings me peace. In him, in me, you'll have peace. I've spoken these things to you that in me you might have peace. Hallelujah. When he gave us his peace, he gave us his victory. Amen. His triumph over the world is our triumph over the world. All right. Pastor Michelle ministered Sunday night on knowing your seat, being able to locate your seat, knowing where your seat was. Well, the Bible says, according to Ephesians chapter 2, that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ, far above all principality, all power, all might, all dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. That seat was not won by me. That seat was won by Christ. But that seat is jointly mine due to my faith in the finished work of Christ. That seat is joint, jointly mine. His victory is my victory. Oh, hallelujah. His triumph over the world is my triumph over the world. See, I walk in his triumph by walking in his peace. If I really believe I'm in victory, I'm going to walk in peace. If I really believe I have triumphed in his triumph, I'm going to walk in peace. If I really believe it, that's the reality of it. Hallelujah. See, and very often what people say is, well, you know, if, if they're not at peace, they've allowed the situation to overwhelm them. They, they have, but why? Because they didn't really understand the triumph that was theirs. If I understand that I, his triumph is my triumph, his triumph over the world is my triumph over the world, understand. Let, let's, let's look at that again because he said, I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and conquered it for you. So, so notice. He said, I have overcome the world for you. I have conquered it for you. I have deprived it of power to harm you and conquered it 
for you. Anything that anybody does for me means then that I can walk into that that they did for me, and it's mine. His triumph is my triumph. His triumph over the world is my triumph over the world. What does that mean? Nothing in the world has the power to harm me because it's been deprived of power. It's been deprived of the ability to hurt me. Hallelujah. So when he gave us his peace, he gave us his victory. When he gave us his triumph, we triumphed over the world. We walk in this triumph by walking in his peace. Peace anchors us to this triumph. Peace anchors us to this victory. Hallelujah. Every aspect of Christ's victory produces peace in the life of the believer. Every aspect of Christ's victory produces peace in the life of a believer. Hallelujah. And, and that's why it should be, it should be a um, contradiction of terms for someone who is a believer to say they have no peace. Because if I'm in Christ, I was given his peace. How can you be concerned about something when it's been conquered? How can you be concerned about something when you have the victory over it? And, and see, that's not just a word of faith theology. That's what the Bible says. Amen. And, and a lot of times that's what, that's what people boil it down to, that it's just our theology. How you doing, brother? Oh, walking in victory. Praise God, got the victory. And they no more believe that than a man in the moon. And if you follow them around, there's no peace. No peace, no victory. If you got victory, you've got peace. Because he said, in me, you'll have peace. So here's what I'm trying to drive home with this. Is peace is not the absence of trials. Jesus said in the world you'll face those. All right? Peace is knowing that whatever I'm facing has been deprived of its power to hurt me. Hallelujah. You know, I saw something a number of years ago, and uh, from time to time, you'd see, you'd see it a lot more years ago, but they would show uh, a man, and he was usually in, in uh, a nation like India or a Middle Eastern nation or something of that nature, and, uh, and he would be playing a flute, and, and a cobra would be in a basket, and they'd be following that flute as the man was playing, and of course, they made it sound like, you know, the cobra's dancing, but he's actually following that flute, you know, and they thought, oh, look, at, look he has some mastery over that cobra. What has been found is that in most cases, that cobra's mouth was sewed shut. So it's responding like a cobra would to the movement of this flute because that's what it does for protection. But why was the man not afraid? That cobra had been deprived of its ability to harm him. You understand that? Hallelujah. Well, the Bible calls the devil a thief. It calls him a liar. It calls him a murderer. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he's been deprived of his power to do that in my life through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So that man sat in front of that snake with no fear whatsoever because he knew something everybody else didn't know. He knew that cobra had been deprived of its ability to harm him. Well, Jesus said that he had deprived the world of its ability to harm you. Understand that. 
He didn't say you wouldn't have trials, that you wouldn't face challenges. He said, but here's what I want you to understand. I have deprived that challenge of the ability to harm you. Hallelujah. So here's the thing that I always, that I always ask. So what's better, no trials or understanding that whatever trial comes, it can't harm me? Well, you're, you're not going to live in this earth with no trials. You're just not going to because we live in a fallen world. But here's the thing. If you know by virtue of being in Christ that it can't harm you, you keep your peace. You keep your peace. Oh, hallelujah. Am I helping you? Any fear comes from a lack of peace. Any fear. Glory. Amen. And, and, and people can say, oh, I'm not even going to get into that, but they, they have a number of, of different fears that people deal with. And, and they, try to, they try to minimize it by just saying, well, you know, I just don't like them. Well, you'll never defeat it if you don't call it what it is and let the peace of God replace it. I will tell you that I'm believing more and more the longer I I live this Christian walk. I'm believing more and more that when you give place to any fear, you give place to all fear. Peace has to govern all of us. This is so important because you're going to face those challenges, but yet they have been deprived of the power to hurt you. Hallelujah. In Isaiah chapter 32. So, every aspect of Christ's victory produces peace in the life of the believer. We could say every aspect of redemption produces peace in the life of the believer. Isaiah 32, 17, it says, And the work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Now, this one word, peace, is shalom. When it says the work of righteousness shall be peace, shalom and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Well, quietness and assurance forever are another Hebrew word that mean peace. The Amplified Bible says the effect of righteousness will be peace, internal and external. And the result of righteousness will be quietness and confident trust forever. So the effect of righteousness is peace. It is shalom, that undisturbed composure, that unmovedness, that nothing missing, nothing broken, wholeness and completeness by implication, prosperity. All right? And the effect of righteousness is quietness and confident trust. What does that mean? Peace is directly connected to righteousness. Peace is directly connected to righteousness. This is so important, all right, because the Bible, the Bible talks about uh, the kingdom of God, and the apostle Paul wrote, and he said, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So, so notice what anchors Those three things, righteousness. And what does that produce? Joy and peace. And that's the rule of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The kingdom of God is not what you do. It's not what you go through. The kingdom of God is this. You are righteous, and because you're righteous, you have joy and you have peace. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 3,
Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Now, Romans 3, uh, Paul, of course, the, the first part of the book of Romans, Paul is setting forth his case as for why God brought the Gentiles into the new covenant, into the covenant of Abraham. And uh, he begins talking about the Jew and the Gentile. And uh, he begins, and we're not going to read all of this, but uh, he starts talking about righteousness and unrighteousness, all right? And one group is bragging on against the other group. And then he gets to verse 10, and he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. All right? Well, without Christ, I can't be righteous. So he's saying the Jews that are not believers are not righteous, and the Gentiles that are not believers are not righteous. And then notice verse 10, or verse 17. He says, and the way, notice, the way of peace they have not known. Well, why have they not known the way of peace? They're not righteous. They're not righteous. If you're not righteous, you cannot know peace. Because the order is righteousness, peace, joy, righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. They have not known the way of peace. They have not known it. Hallelujah. Now, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. Now, notice how often it's, it's, it's saying this, this righteousness of God, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. So before salvation, no one had any peace. Righteousness. Salvation is the way of peace. When we made Jesus our Lord, we were made the righteousness of God. Or the, the, the literal Greek says we received the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. All right? We received that. What did we have before? We had unrighteousness, non-righteousness. And what did we not know? The way of peace. But then when we were made righteous, now we know the way of peace. Because righteousness results in me being at peace with God. And when I'm at peace with God, the fruit of peace can flow in my life. The, the book of Romans chapter 5. And verse 1 gives us a very good indication of this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When, when it says here, the verb here of have, we have peace, the, the Greek verb is in the present tense. And here's what it means. It does not mean let us get peace or let us obtain peace, but let us keep on having and enjoying peace. How? Through our justification. Through our having been made right. As believers were to consistently, constantly enjoy the peace that God has given, through what? Through our having been made righteous. That's the core of you operating the fruit of peace is knowing your standing with God. Hallelujah. The, these are things, you know, Peter wrote, and he said, he made this statement. He said, uh, uh, 
I need to say some of these same things to you so I can stir up your faith. Stir you up by putting you in remembrance of these things. Oh, hallelujah. That's so important because that's at the foundation of your peace. If you don't make much of your righteousness, there's, you're probably not walking in much peace because that's the way of peace. If I don't have peace with God, if I don't make much of my peace with God, it's hard for that peace to operate in my life on this earth because that's what brought the peace. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks some more about this peace. And verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He himself is our peace. Peace. Now, see, that's what Jesus meant when he said in John 16, he said, in, I've said these things to you so that in me you might have peace. Well, what does that mean? Without being in him, I can't have peace because he is our peace. He himself is our peace. If I have Christ, I have peace. Why? He gave me his peace. If I have his peace, I have his victory. Why? Because in his peace came his victory. If I have his peace, I have his triumph. If I have his peace, the world has been deprived of the ability to hurt me or harm me because I've got his peace. And, and that comes by virtue of being in Christ. He hath made both one, broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, all right, to make within himself or he himself of twain two different groups, one new man, and what did he do when he did that? He made peace, not just not between the, 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 the racial divide, not between the two different, the Gentile and the Jew, all right? In the spirit realm, there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. When he broke down that middle wall of partition, he made peace. Peace with what? Peace with the Jew had peace with God who would believe on Jesus Christ. The Gentile had peace with God that would believe on Jesus Christ. He made them both one. They were two, now they're one. And what was the result of that? Peace. Peace. Hallelujah. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached, notice, peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. He came and preached peace, proclaimed peace to us. So, so when Jesus was in the earth, what was he proclaiming? Peace with God. Peace with God. When, when the angels broke the sky open that night to the shepherds, the first thing they said was, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Hallelujah. What, what does that mean? God was always at peace. Man was not at peace with God. You can't walk in the fruit of peace without being at peace with God because they're part of the reborn human spirit. And once you become at peace with God, you get the fruit of the spirit of peace. And that fruit of the spirit of peace is anchored in the peace that we have with God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and as a result of our being made righteous in Christ. I have peace with God. Hallelujah. Jesus is our peace. Jesus made peace. Jesus preached peace. Now, if you don't have a righteousness mindset, you'll have trouble walking in peace. And, and let me explain this to you. If you're always focused on your failures, you don't have a righteousness mindset. 
if, if you're always focused on your mistakes, you don't have a righteousness mindset. If you think God's mad at you, you don't have a righteousness mindset. And what's the result of all of those? No peace. No peace. And Jesus is our peace. Hallelujah. He made peace, and he proclaimed peace. He preached peace. Now, this is vital. This is so important, this righteousness mindset. And you got to understand something. It's, it's something that you got to move past having to work up, and you have to move into just living it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. A better term would be I have the righteousness of God in Christ. Because, you know, we think right standing with God, and I think that just kind of flies over some people's heads. I don't, I don't know that many believers understand the true depth of having right standing with God. Having, being in right standing with God. How deep that really is. Be, be, amen. Because, because that, that simply means that God justified you, all right, treated your life, treated you as if you had never sinned based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and he gave you his righteousness, his right standing, hallelujah, and made you his. Now, that's a reason to have peace, because I'm right with God. I don't have peace because I'm not going to hell. I have peace because I'm right with God. I don't have peace because my name's written down in glory. I have peace because I'm right with God. Hallelujah. Now, Isaiah 53. We'll start wrapping this up with this. And uh, verse 5. It says, He, meaning Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The Amplified Bible says, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. Now, right here, Isaiah brings this peace into the redemption aspect. Because this is where he suffered for our redemption. And he says there was a price that was needful to obtain peace. It was a chastisement. And it fell on Jesus. And over and over again in different translations, you see this. One translation says he endured the breaking that made us whole. A lack of peace is a lack of wholeness. To have peace is to have wholeness. So Jesus was broken so I could be whole and operate in that peace. One says he was beaten so we could be whole. Another says punishment for our peace was upon him. So all throughout Scripture, Peace is tied to our redemption. All throughout Scripture. That's why you want to make much of your redemption. You want to make much of the fact that you're redeemed. Why? Because it means I have the peace that has deprived the world of its ability to harm me. That's what it means. If you're redeemed, the world is has been deprived of its ability to harm you. Do you understand that? If you are redeemed, and you know you're redeemed, 
you have been, the world has been deprived of its ability to harm you. That's why in whatever circumstances that are going on in the world, we have victory, we have overcoming ability, we walk through it with the victory of God, we're blessed in every situation. Why? Because every circumstance in the world has been deprived of its ability to harm me. So said Jesus Christ, it's the truth. You got to make much of the fact that you're the righteousness of God. Got to make much of that. Why? It's tied to my peace. My peace is tied to that. Peace is the way of righteousness. That's important. See, when the enemy wants to try to rob your peace, listen to me. He's really after your righteousness. He's after your sense of righteousness. Because as long as you know you're righteous and you make much of it and you walk as though that's the case, you're going to be at peace. So very often when he's trying to get your peace, he's trying to get your righteousness. Trying to get your sense of righteousness. He can't get your righteousness. But he'll try to get your sense of righteousness. Think about this for a moment. Uh, I've raised a few children and raising one now. And I can tell when they're uneasy about something. And a lot of times they're uneasy because maybe they've done something they shouldn't have done. And people will say, well, it's their conscience bothering them. Well, it is. But, but what is it? They don't feel as if they're at right standing with their parent. And so what's it get? Their peace. And that's why somebody will tell the truth about something they did or somebody will admit something they did wrong. And here's, watch, probably 100 times out of 100, they'll go, whew, boy, I sure feel better. Glad I got that off my chest. Well, I understand a weight was lifted, but why was the weight lifted? We're at peace. We're at peace. Hallelujah. Make much of the fact that you're righteous. I'm righteous in God's sight. That's the way of peace. That is the way of peace. And you got to make much of that. Because when the enemy's trying to rob your peace, he's after your sense of righteousness. And listen, when he get, if he gets your sense of righteousness, you are at his mercy. You got to understand that. If the enemy gets your sense of being right with God, you're at his mercy. Because what gives you boldness to stand before the Father, what gives you boldness to stand in the face of the enemy, and what gives you boldness to stand in the presence of any man or woman is the fact that you know you're righteous. If the enemy gets that sense of righteousness away from you, you're at his mercy. But when I know I'm righteous and I make much of it, I have peace. Number one, I have peace with God. Number two, I have peace with man. Hallelujah. I have peace with God and I have peace with man. Why? Because I know I'm right with God. You got to make much of that. You got to make much of that. Hallelujah. The enemy says, whatever he says, well, this isn't going to happen this time. Well, I don't, what do you mean? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have, I have, I have, I have the ability in me, inherent in me, to be a world overcomer. I always overcome. Right? Why? Because whatever the enemy is, it has been deprived of power to harm me. Hallelujah. And I'll close with this. 
That's why I want you to remember the man playing that flute. He was so confident because he knew that serpent had been deprived of the ability to harm him. Ever what you see in the world, ever what you hear in the world, ever what the report is, remember something. It's been deprived of the ability to harm you. How? By Jesus Christ. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. His victory is my victory. His triumph is my triumph. In Him, in Him, I can't be defeated. In Him, I can't lose. In Him, I can't be overrun by the enemy. In Him, everything is going my way. In Him, I'm more than a conqueror. In Him, I'm always called to tri cause to triumph. In Him, the greater one is on the inside of me. In Him, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. In Him, nothing is impossible. And what does that produce, my family? Great peace. Great peace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, the Lord's good to us. Glory to God. Well, don't forget, of course, Sunday morning we'll be with you ministering the Word of God. Uh, don't forget the DeSoto Days outreach uh, this coming up weekend. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a great turnout. If you've not yet signed up for the outreach, uh, please sign up in the foyer on your way out. And uh, we'll give you something to do, and it's going to be a really, really, really good time in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord is so good to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so uh, pleased that uh, uh, we welcomed our newest faith builder uh, to the faith builders family here uh, in the last couple days. Uh, little Mr. Noah Poole was born into the earth. Uh, another spiritual grandson that greatness is awaiting. And uh, so we're excited about that. So you can congratulate uh, Sister Kathleen, uh, another grandchild to uh, add to her group. Amen. And uh, uh, Pastor Ron and Sister Deborah, you can congratulate them as well as we're so pleased as to how God is blessing them. Amen. Stand on your feet tonight. If you would, I want our uh, uh, prayer ministers to come. If you need prayer for anything, uh, after we declare our vision, you can come and have these pray with you, and they'll agree with you and believe God with you. Amen. Uh, say it with me tonight. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.